And we are so fortunate and honored today to have Tiffany Duke. Tiffany, you're gonna have to tell me how you pronounce your last name, I'm sorry. Um, from the US Coordinating um, Network of Cochrane. Uh, she's the coordinator for the US Network and the network was relaunched uh, about a year and a half ago, and we became one of the affiliates. And I was privileged enough to become the director of our um, University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus affiliate. Uh, Tiffany has been doing an amazing job uh, bringing in all of our US Cochrane affiliates and organizing all of our events, especially in this extremely challenging time with the pandemic and with uh, new funding challenges to Cochrane. So I'm sure she'll be touching on a few of those uh, issues in, our, in her talk. And she's based in Pacific time. So thank you for joining us before your lunch hour, uh, Tiffany, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Bob and Nina and Lisa. It's so great to be here. Um, like Bob said, this is the Cochrane Colorado Affiliate Center of the Cochrane US Network. And Nina and Bob and Lisa are um, some of the model member networks and really are dedicated to Cochrane and have really provided a lot of their um, sweat, blood, tears to growing this US network. So I'm really happy to be here and thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, should I go ahead and share my screen, Nina? Yeah, go ahead. And is your first poll right away? Or you marked it on the slides, right? Second slide, yeah. Second slide, all right, excellent. I will watch for it. All right, so, sorry guys. I have a telling Nina you know, my screens start, I have two screens and they started acting differently, of course, this morning. <laughs> okay, I think. There we go, that that's, good? that's perfect. Okay. Yep, we've got the slide and, oh, and, and your face. Except so I'm awesome. not at the beginning at all, so. <laughs> <laughs> we forgot to go back to the first slide, didn't we? Go to the beginning. All right. Okay. So like Bob said, I'm Tiffany Duque. You were close. Actually, Duque is the Spanish and French word for Duke. So if you say Duke, you're actually just translating it. So good job. Um, and I'm the senior officer of the Cochrane US Network. And you guys are at the Strauss House, Strauss House Sciences Library, Rocky Mountain Cochrane webinar series. So here's a little overview of what I'll cover today. Um, Cochrane and evidence synthesis, the Cochrane US network, some of our US projects and events, the infodemic, um, how we are engaging and hoping to engage audiences, and how anyone can get involved. And Tiffany, before you go further, I just want yeah. to confirm that we're recording today's session. Nina, I don't see my record button on. Am yes, I supposed I, yeah, to push it? It's, yep. Okay, sorry for we the are. interruption. Don't want to miss what you have to say. Yeah, no worries. Right. Right. Reminder bomb. Yeah, thanks. All right, so we'll do. I'll do the slide, Nina, and then we can do the poll quick. Um, so I'm sure many of you are familiar with Cochrane, but you know, just in case we have some new people in the audience, thank you for coming. Um, Cochrane is for anyone interested in using high quality information to make health decisions. So practitioners, patients, caretakers, researchers, funders, Cochrane Evidence provides a powerful tool for um, increasing knowledge and decision-making. And Cochrane has over 13,000 members and 82,000 supporters from 130 countries. So it really is a global um, organization. So Nina, we can launch the first poll. All righty. Just see what you guys already know about Cochrane before I get into the presentation. So what Ready doesn't Cochrane do? Do you guys see it? All right, I'll give you a minute to. All right, Nina, let me know when you think answers are pretty much in. Sure, so we, we've got about 55 of 90. Res oh, they're pouring in here. We'll give it about 10 more seconds. It's a little bit hard if you're not super familiar with Cochrane. I'll let it go 45 seconds. Yeah. 
All right. So there are results, Tiffany. I don't see them, I guess, because oh, I you don't, I guess, oh. yeah. um, share results. There we go. The big blue button that says go. share results. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Wow, you guys are good. So develop guidelines is correct that everything else on this list Cochrane does do, um, including produce YouTube videos, and we do not develop guidelines or recommendations. So that is why we need all of you. All right. Thanks, Nina. Sure. Now it's not letting me scroll through my slides. There we go. Okay. Okay. So a systematic review, it takes all available primary evidence, such as randomized control trials and observational studies on a very specific topic, and it synthesizes that evidence, it weighs it, it grades it, it looks at all of the evidence and all of those studies to then produce new high quality evidence that can be used by practitioners, policymakers, patients, caretakers, et cetera. And Cochrane holds high standards for its systematic review authors. You have to follow rigorous and systematic methods in order for your work to be published on the Cochrane Library. So it's, it's a prestigious um, recognition for an author. Cochrane is the international standard for synthesized evidence. And there is a Cochrane handbook for systematic reviews, which is great. It's free online, the link is there. It's easy to use online. It's broken out by chapter. It's um, it's a big book, but it's it's managed really well on the online version. So feel free to check that out. And quickly, I just wanted to go into why a systematic is important and what it can really do. So I'm sure some of you are really familiar with this, whereas to be honest, before I started with Cochrane, um, I had worked adjacent to systematic systematic reviews many times, but mostly on the implementation side of once the systematic review is published, how do you turn that into programs? So this, this was really helpful to me in understanding systematic reviews. So this is an example on thrombolytic therapy for heart disease. So you can see that in 1960, there was one, one RCT with 23 patients on thrombolytic therapy. The odds ratio was huge. The confidence interval was really wide. It cost the null, um, so not doesn't show a lot of effects. But then you get 10 years later, you're down into the 1970s, the early 70s, then you get, there's 10 RCTs. You have a cumulative total of 2,500 patients. And now you can start to see the confidence interval is narrowing. It's not crossing the null value. The P is less than 0.01. So you're starting to see true effect of this therapy. Um, then you're getting down into 1980, where you've already had 23 randomized control trials um, studying this therapy, pretty much all showing that it's effect effective. Um, but if you look over to the right side in the textbook and review recommendations box, you'll see that in recommendations and textbooks and guidelines up to 1980, it's still not listed anywhere. It's mostly not mentioned. In 1980, you get one specific mention of it in a textbook or a guideline. But even after 23 randomized control trials, because no one was really keeping track of this evidence and doing meta-analyses and systematic reviews, doctors didn't, didn't see this cumulative evidence. So you get down to 1990. Now you have almost 50,000 patients that have been randomized into 70 different randomized control trials. It's very clear with a 0 0.00001 p-value, extremely narrow confidence intervals that this treatment obviously works. So what could have been known in 1980, or at least in the mid 80s, was not regularly recommended, was not in textbooks, was not specifically recommended until the 19, until you get to about probably 1989, where you see it's routinely mentioned in 15 textbooks. So thousands, tens of thousands of patients were randomized to a placebo, placebo group when they could have been already getting this therapy. So not only is that dangerous, but all of the money that was spent and human resources and time um, doing these extra RCTs. So if someone had been systematically keeping track of the evidence, um, a lot of this could have been avoided. So this is really why cumulative meta-analyses and synthesizing evidence is very important. 
And this is actually a slide by Tian Jing Li, who is a professor at Anschutz Medical College and um, a well-known Cochrane researcher. So thanks, Tian Jing, if you're here. So all of Cochrane's systematic reviews are published in the Cochrane Database for Systematic Reviews. It's a journal. There's 12 issues per year, and it's published by Wiley on the Cochrane Library. So the database of systematic reviews is one part of the Cochrane Library. The CDSR includes all Cochrane reviews and protocols by all review groups. It has a high impact factor at 7.9 and is ranked 10 out of the 165 journals in the medicine general and internal category. So it's, it's a high ranking journal, it's impactful. Um, and that's available on the Cochrane Library through a subscription. So how are Cochrane reviews used? Well, for this is a great example showing that WHO is one of the regular users of Cochrane um, science, sorry, of Cochrane evidence and support. So 80% of WHO guidelines on average use Cochrane reviews. So that's, that's really great for Cochrane and for WHO. So that's a little overview of Cochrane at large. So I wanna kind of narrow into the Cochrane US network um, and give you a little background on specific to the US. So like Bob said, um, when we started, the network was launched in June, 2019. So we're just coming up on our second birthday. Um, Cochrane science has been done in the US since Cochrane started in 1994. And there's many Cochrane researchers that have been active in Cochrane for all of those years. However, the Cochrane centers were mainly um, individual institutions, a bit siloed. It was not clear who was doing what. Authors didn't have an easy way to communicate with each other, knowledge share, leverage resources, et cetera. And Cochrane, the organization, knowing the strengths in the US and how many Cochrane researchers there are here, how many users of the Cochrane Library live in the United States, um, they really, push towards creating the first countrywide Cochrane network. So the US network was launched in June, 2019, and applications were open for institutions and review groups who do Cochrane work or want to do Cochrane work to join. And the aim of the Cochrane network is to improve health outcomes for anyone living in the United States by promoting production, understanding, and use of evidence to inform policy and programs in the United States. So who's in the US network? Here is a list of our um, 23 member centers. Um, now we have some review groups you'll see on the left-hand side. Those are topical review groups. So fertility, urology, skin, neonatal, they are in the US network because geographically they live at a US institution. However, most of their research is global research. Then we have one associate center called US West, which comprises five institutions on the West Coast doing Cochrane research. And then we have 15 affiliate centers, which are individual institutions such as Academy Health, Tufts University, American College of Physicians, MD Anderson, Colorado, Maryland, et cetera. So membership is, is free. Um, there is a bit of an application process, but if you feel like your institution would be a great member, please let us know. The goals of the US network are to build and sustain a collaborative network and really um, keep ourselves up and running and impactful, facilitate evidence production and dissemination, and then advocate for that evidence. We have a five member executive committee. These five people are all directors of one of the 23 Cochrane US centers. There was voting at the inception of the network. Anyone who was interested could put their name forward and then voting took place. And these were the five chosen. Jean Marie and Drew are the co-chairs. And I also sit in the executive committee. So how do you build a network? What have we been doing? So there's a lot going on, like Bob said, and then COVID. So, you know, everything was a bit derailed, but we've really made a lot of progress in two years despite that. So we have a strategic plan. We developed a strategic plan with a work group. We then developed a voting mechanism to adopt the plan and it is now being used to prioritize our projects and initiatives. We have governance that we've developed such as voting procedures, hiring procedures, new member applications. We have terms of reference for positions such as the senior officer and center directors. 
we have mapping exercises so that we can really focus our efforts on realistic and meaningful projects. And then we have our operations. So the executive committee, committee meets twice a month. We have full network meetings every other month where anyone involved in the 23 Cochrane centers can join our meetings. And those are usually really informative and, and fun and lively. On the alternating months, we have directors meetings. So for the 23 center directors, we have a weekly newsletter open to anyone. We have a listserv events. And my position is actually a member of the Cochrane Central Executive Team as, as well, which is great for liaising with Cochrane Central and all of the geographic and review groups all over the, the world. So it's a great um, connection with Cochrane Central. And then impact is really, you know, where we're headed and what, what we want to focus on. So our member centers get to help shape the direction and priorities of our network. We make sure we stick within Cochrane's mission and vision. We really want to adapt to the U.S. context and influence healthcare here. We want to reach priority populations so that we can ultimately improve health outcomes for all people living in the U.S. So this is a bit of a busy slide, but you guys can just eye it while I kind of explain it. So how do we advocate for our evidence? How, how are we reaching out to partners and, and what kinds of events are we doing? So we've really kind of, you know, raised our hand for a lot of events. We've organized some ourselves. We've jumped on board with other partners and we've just really been getting our name out there. We did an advanced method symposium that was hosted by Tian Jing Li at Colorado and funded by AHRQ. We are part of the first annual evidence-based healthcare day. Right now, going on this week and next is the Cornell WHO Cochrane Summer Institute. Uh, we had an International Women's Day webinar for Women's Day this year, which was great. It's on our website if you'd like to watch it. Uh, we were invited as an official observer to the PAHO 50th Directing Council, et cetera. So those are the things that, that we've been up to lately and some of the partners we've been engaging with. So how do we facilitate the production and dissemination of the evidence? So we have a lot of trainings and projects and learning events that go on at all times. There's something going on like this webinar series. Um, almost everything is free. We have a neonatal evidence classroom, which is fantastic. I encourage you to check it out. It's all free. We have numerous systematic review trainings by a number of our universities. Our grade working group member has a guideline development workshop. Um, Nina and Lisa, actually from Colorado, our hosts, are starting an information specialist initiative within the US network. We're kicking off a mentoring program. And you guys are at the Colorado webinar series, which is a monthly series. So please join us again. Another way that we really reach people and partners and audiences is with our communications and social media program. We have a full PR and communications program. Available to all of our members is network co-branding. So using the US network logo on their websites, their training materials, PowerPoints, on their um, signature blocks and their emails. And this really promotes us and also creates brand recognition. We have a full updated and um, full use network website with all of the things going on in Cochrane US and Cochrane Central. And we're happy to promote our partner and friends information on the website too. Same with Twitter. I encourage you to follow us where you'll see things like our mentoring program kickoff contest. And um, a lot of our events are available on Twitter. And then please subscribe to our newsletter um, as well. And then our listserv is an internal listserv. It's just a great way for all of our members to share information. So what are the benefits of the US network? What, what do we hope to accomplish? Um, how can we have a distinctive voice and not just be another cook in the kitchen? So within our network, we have 23 highly reputable entities, multidisciplinary experts, we're all speaking with one voice towards a common goal and we're all found in one place. We're a non-political voice in the US, which we really want to use to reach some of those spaces that given the current climate in the United States, governmental or other um, guideline or science information institutes may not be able to speak with the freedom that is afforded us as a non-political UK-based NGO. So we really wanna take advantage of that. We provide accessible, affordable, usually free 
trustworthy health information to anybody. We have numerous opportunities for students and professionals and educators and the public to engage with us in meaningful ways. We want to ensure everyone understands Cochrane Science and our products and what they can do and how they can use it. We want to identify knowledge gaps in the United States around health science and then promote subsequent research around that at national and regional levels. And we also liaise between Cochrane and Cochrane US. So all of the global review topical groups, all of the geographic networks, um, we have instant access to all of those amazing researchers across the globe. So that was a lot of talking and um, your heads are probably spinning. So I just want to kind of um, drill down for a second and just show you a highlight of a couple of our different projects going on so you can get a sense of what we're actually doing and what all of this background stuff that I'm saying um, looks like. So there's three examples that I'm gonna talk about. A visual data series, a library consortium. I imagine we have a number of librarians and information specialists in our audience today and our pilot mentoring program. So Armour University School of Medicine and Cochrane are working together on a visual data series. So this started um, when COVID hit and systematic reviews were coming out. Um, systematic reviews can be difficult and lengthy to read. They're not always super understandable. So these medical students decided to start a series of infographics or visual data. So they're alerted when a high profile review is published and they then create accurate and easy to read visual abstracts that are published on, on the Cochrane Library on Cochrane.org. They're published along with the review and the plain language summary and a news item. So these students are given acknowledgement by being um, their work being published on the website. They have their names on the bottom of all of the graphics and they're also all earning membership points towards anything that might behind, be behind a payroll at Cochrane. So here's one example. It might be a little hard to read on your screens, um, but this is a Cochrane Rapid Review on international travel-related travel measures for the pandemic. So you can see they have here the measures with some inf infographics, the methodology with some graphics, the limitations, the conclusions, the findings. So it's, it's not super, plain language um, or necessarily a graphic, but it is certainly helpful and far easier and quicker in COVID times when people need information now um, on the systematic review. Their names are at the bottom and this is then available for free on the Cochrane website. Here's a second one, hydrochloroquine, which we all know was a bit of a failure. Um, so this is just great. It tells you how many studies were included how they graded the evidence. Again, what were some of the limitations? And then the conclusion there at the bottom, with their names and their credit. So this is a really exciting series. We also have the Ohio Link Library Initiative. So this Ohio Link is a library consortium. It was established in Ohio in 1992 and comprises 88 academic institutions and the state library. In 2019, an initiative was formed, including our Wiley Publishers, the Ohio Link Library Consortium, and the Cochrane Group at Ohio State. In December of this past year, the governor funded um, a grant award to Ohio Link to help with gaps in access to information about COVID-19. And knowing that the Cochrane Library is a very reliable source of information, this grant then went to ensure that the library is available to all Ohioans. So in April, just last month, this was launched. All people living in Ohio have access to the full Cochrane Library, including the Cochrane Database of Systematic Reviews, which is the journal usually behind a paywall. All of the trainings, all of the infographics, the YouTube videos, the plain language summaries, et cetera. So this is really exciting. It's a pilot program. Um, we hope to see it take off and get some sustainable funding. And I know Lisa and Nina have information on other state library consortiums. So if you think that your state may be interested in something like this, please do let us know. And then the third project I just wanna highlight is our mentoring pilot program. As I briefly mentioned before, this started as a Twitter contest on one hand, because I wanted to grow our Twitter, Twitter audience and um, really you know, get that audience knowing who we are. And I hope to get about 50 new followers. And we ended up getting 
almost 250 new followers. So in that regard, it was very successful. This is the information that was put out there for anyone interested in kind of joining the contest. There are a few inclusion criteria, such as having an interest in health science, already either working in evidence synthesis or being curious about evidence synthesis, and importantly, identifying with a historically underserved or marginalized population group, because we really do as a network want to work towards inclusivity, racial justice, and reaching some of those priority populations. So along with I, um, those candidate inclusion criteria, there were rules for entry, which was just follow us and then tweet and tag us. And then anyone who did that received an a link to an application. So who applied? The applications closed on Friday and we got 44 potential mentees and we can only choose a few. So we're gonna have to be very specific and um, Kind of purposeful about how we choose them but it's really exciting it's a great problem to have so in this first graph the brown bars um i thought it was really interesting that almost 50 percent 47.7 percent of our applicants put non-applicable for when i asked do you identify with any of the following um groups now that was one of the inclusion criteria so that's something we're going to have to think about um, but we did get a number of people living with a disability from a historically marginalized population, low income, LGBTQ, and single parent. Now, one reason we may have had 50% of people put non-applicable is because if you look down right below this to where do you currently live? Now, while in my mind, this was a US contest for a US mentoring program, given where the US network, you cannot control where your tweets go. And the tweets ended up getting amplified quite a lot in Latin and South America, which is great. And we have a number of Cochrane country teams in a number of different countries in Latin and South America. Um, so I think one hypothesis I have is that because almost 50% of our applicants were from the Latin America region and the Caribbean, in their mind, um, you know, being Latinx, does not constitute being a marginalized or minority population in their countries, whereas in the United States, if they were living here, um, you know, there would be that difference. Um, so, you know, we're gonna, we'll have to go through all of this. Like I said, applications just closed and we'll, we'll decide, you know, what do we do? Only 10% of our applicants were from the US, which, um, and 37% from a whole plethora of countries, which is really amazing to see the interest um, all over the globe in Cochrane. And then with our age groups, um, it was pretty spread out, um, a number on the younger side, which makes sense. And then current status, undergraduate, graduate, um, early and mid-career professionals. So we got a really wide range of people and we're really interested um, in, in making this happen and reaching people who will then go back to these priority populations, people who may ha not have had these types of opportunities in their studies or in their careers so far. So we will match them with some of the mentors that have volunteered from the US network with um, interest groups and time commitment. And we will have um, a pilot 12 month mentoring program which we then hope to scale up and continue. Okay. So we have the reviews on the products and all the ways that you can get involved in trainings and but how do we reach the users, how do we get to them and how do we let them know that that all of this is available. So one way is informing informing guidance so as I mentioned before a number of Cochrane reviews are used to inform WHO guidelines, this is an example of a living systematic review carried out by our, our Cornell. Cochrane affiliate here in the US um, and their living systematic review contributed to the Cochrane, um, to the WHO guidelines on breastfeeding and COVID. We have plain language summaries. So any pu published review is available with a plain language summary. These are all free, whether or not the review itself is behind the paywall. Plain language summaries are free, they're easily searchable, and this is often the version that most users will see. We realize that English is not everyone's first language, so there's almost 30,000 translations in 15 languages, and our podcasts are in 11 languages, 180 podcasts in 11 different languages, and again, these are all free. 
similar to the visual data series, there's a number of decision aids and infographics that help explain in an easy digestible way a systematic review. These are also all free and available on the Cochrane Library. And then we do YouTube videos and Facebook Live events. So this example is Mira from our executive committee. She was the first author on a rapid review for COVID screening. And she did a five minute YouTube video where she talked about the review, why it was important, what they studied, what they looked at, and then what the, what the conclusions mean. So a really great and kind of interactive way to learn about the reviews and meet some of the authors. There's a plethora of trainings available on the website. Now some are behind a paywall, but if you get involved in Cochrane and start earning membership points, you'll be able to take those. However, many, many, many are free. Cochrane Evidence Essentials, RevMan, Providence, risk of bias, knowledge translation, really just so many topics on evidence synthesis and systematic reviews um, from short to long to continuing over months, anything that you wanna learn, you can really, really find it here. There's also something called the task exchange. So for example, this task was posted by Cochrane Neonatal. The task exchange is open for anyone to access and anyone to participate in. Now, Cochrane Needle Needle posted, we need Chinese translation for two of our articles. So if this is something that you would be able to provide, you would get in touch with them, click on this, this experience, and you would work out with the authors some sort of um, payment. Sometimes it's money, sometimes it's Cochrane membership points, sometimes it's authorship. So this is available for anyone to go on from um, novice to expert and see how you can interact with Cochrane projects. And Cochrane crowd, similarly, but probably more for the less experienced and younger crowd, is a series of monthly, sometimes more often, challenges. They're usually about three hours. They're for anyone across the globe. As you can see, there's almost 20,000 contributors from almost 160 countries. Within those three hours, you receive about a 30-minute training on how to read and um, understand systematic reviews, how to extract the data and look for bias. And then in the rest of the time that you are given systematic reviews to read and extract data, sometimes you're helping COVID authors, sometimes you're helping create information. Um, it's really a great and free and exciting way to not only meet people, but to get involved in Cochrane and you also earn membership points. So how do we continue to engage audiences? How do we reach um, academic societies and policymakers on the government in the United States? Now, this is really where I hope to engage all of you as the audience. I know you're from, I'm sure, many different um, health sectors. So I, this is, you know, we've done the storming, norming, and performing as a network. So this is where we, we want to get into the performing and we want input and feedback and stakeholders um, around the United States. So public health and medicine practitioners, guideline and recommendation developers and implementers, hospital systems, policymakers, researchers, and then people, of course, from consumer groups and our priority populations. So um, you know, our next steps are how do we reach these people how do we make sure Cochrane Science is getting out there and making an impact? So now these are not all super public, so but because you guys are here, you get the inside scoop. So these are some of our exploratory, informal, and growing partnerships. Now, for example, with the Guidelines International Network, specifically with Gin North America, we've already co-hosted a number of events. We information share, we tweet each other's stuff, we're on each other's newsletters. Um, and we really look forward to engaging with them more given that they work in guidelines. We um, have worked a little bit with Consumers United for Evidence and not info sharing and attending each other's meetings. Uh, we've, we've reached out to the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which is a huge professional society, and we're excited to work with them. Um, AHRQ, CDC, now some of these have just been uh, more informal conversations and ex explorations as to what would be possible what kinds of um, projects could we potentially do? What could we prioritize that would be a win-win for both? Um, so some of these are still kind of just in the exploration phase. 
And for example, the USDA, um, you know, potentially they use systematic reviews for their DRI updates. Is there a, an opportunity there? And then of course, there's opportunity for your organization as well. I'm sure as many of you know, this is kind of the evidence pipeline. So you have the evidence generation here, primary evidence, trials, studies, which are then synthesized into systematic reviews. And then we need all of you to kind of help us get those into guidelines, policy, clinical care, out to our patients, et cetera. One thing that we do keep in mind and we want to make a priority is addressing research waste. So 85% um, of research can be qualified as research waste, and that equates to over $100 billion a year um, globally across the world. So we don't just want to repeat what other people are doing or just do it because we want to say Cochrane did it. We want to know, are our questions relevant? Are they relevant to clinicians and patients? Are our designs and methods appropriate? Can people access the information once we've published it? Is it unbiased? Is it usable? So we do want to be cognizant of this research waste and really prioritize and be meaningful about our partnerships and our projects. So just keeping in the vein with what our collaborators can do. So some are full members of the US network, which is fantastic. Others, um, it's a, a little less informal, such as advocating for our, our evidence and supporting our audience outreach influencing guidelines and recommendations, helping with our plain language summaries and translations, providing feedback, super important on our trainings, on our events, on our materials, on this type of webinar, um, authoring systematic reviews, peer reviewing systematic reviews, helping with prioritization and choosing outcomes that are important. So there's really a lot of ways that, that all of you um, can help us and in turn, um, you know, we can help your, you as well. So here's where, again, we want your help. So who are we involving and why? What do we want to achieve? Um, how do we embed our consumers and our partners into our decision making? How do we build on the existing relationships? So we have 23 amazing members in the US network. They have all of their own existing relationships and partnerships. So how do we leverage that without stepping on toes? How do we reach those important priority populations within the United States? Um, how do we reach out to ABC and NIH and USDA and other groups that are in the health science space in the United States? Uh, so lots of ways for collaboration. And again, I hope to hear from you guys um, once the presentation is over uh, in these areas, any suggestions or feedback. All right, so I feel like I've been talking for a year, but um, let's switch gears a little bit to the infodemic. So I actually have a poll here too, Nina, if you want to put up the infodemic poll. So sure. you may or may not know what the infodemic is, um, and we're about to see who all is familiar with it. All right. Sorry, Tiffany, I'm trying to figure out how to launch poll number two here. No worries. There it is, poll number two. Sorry about that, folks. Alrighty, here it comes. What is the infodemic? We'll go Wait, about 30 no. seconds here. Perfect. And whether or not you know, this is a little bit easier of a question, but do read the answers. All right, close it. Let me share the results here. Everybody see those? How do we do, Tiffany? Great. Yeah, good. So it was all of the above. So more than half the people got it right. That's great. But there is, you know, some confusion or some unfamiliarity with it. So we will talk about that. Nina, now let me see if I can start. Here we go. Okay. So the WHO declared an infodemic um, a few months ago, I don't know, maybe six months ago now, which is a parallel pandemic to the COVID pandemic. 
But this pandemic is information. It's an overwhelming amount of information, often misinformation and disinformation that is being spread at a wildfire pace across the globe through many, many different information outlets. So a number of um, the WHO put out a call to action on responding to this infodemic to try to help stop the spread of this false information and disinformation and misinformation. Um, and I really thought when I was looking um, up some of the images, it was fun to see a lot of the different infographics that these different groups who have signed on to kind of help combat the infodemic. So I love the United Nations one, try to stop the spread of false information. The National Communications Association, this guy is being overtaken by a wave of information. Um, the Wall Street Journal, these people are looking at what could be the exact same thing, but they're getting totally different data from it and then going out and spreading it. So these are a great graphic way to kind of get a feel for what the infodemic is. So the infodemic is too much information, including false or misleading information in this digital environment during an outbreak. It causes confusion and risk-taking behavior that's harmful to health. It can lead to mistrust in health authorities um, and undermines the public health response. I think um, as people living in the United States, we can all attest to that. And it can intensify and lengthen outbreaks because people are unsure how to protect their health. They're unsure where, where to really look. So Cochrane signed on to the WHO call for action on managing this infodemic. And like I mentioned before, we would like to use our nonpartisan and autonomous voice to really strive for um, being a voice of reliable health information and a source of re reliable health information in the US. Um, and, you know, so how do you manage the infodemic? How do you become a trusted source? So people trust their neighbors, people trust their family members, people trust their um, their pastors and, and people in religious spaces. So being a trusted source, a source of health information is completely different than just being somebody that a person trusts in general. So that that's a difficult space to, um, to get into and to unpack for people. And how do you tell people that although you thoroughly trust your next door neighbor who is um, very well known in his profession and, and a professional and has a great reputation, that person, because they're not, you know, a health practitioner or, or a scientist or, you know, informed, may be spreading misinformation and it may be intentional or it may be disinformation. And disinformation is the more purposeful spread of false information, which also it happens. Um, so how do we manage all of this? So we need to make science accessible and transparent and understandable. We need to maintain trusted sources. So keep using the same trusted sources. Keep promoting evidence-informed policies and guidelines. And really listen to communities and people. What are they concerned about? What are their questions? We can make it accessible, but if it's not understandable or if it's not addressing their concerns, it's not, it's not gonna get very far. Um, how do we get people to understand the risks of, of information that's incorrect and how this may affect their families and, and their own health? And how do we kind of build up a resilience in people to misinformation where they can recognize what may or may not be true or reliable? So we really wanna engage and empower communities to take positive action. So Cochrane has responded and signed on to the WHO's call. Um, we respond with scientific rigor but in a timely fashion that meets the needs of our users. So Cochrane hasn't always been known for its um, speed and criticism of Cochrane over the years has been that sometimes a systematic review can take 18 months to be published. Well, we're not even at 18 months in the COVID pandemic. So obviously you, it can't take that long. So how do you provide evidence in a timely fashion keeping with scientific rigor, but in the face of either not enough evidence or very poor quality evidence. How do you still say something? Because if you don't say something, somebody will. If Cochrane doesn't say something, a plethora of other groups will. 
So that's something that Cochrane has really, really, really been focused on and responding on and has made their turnaround times much quicker and really started engaging a lot of these alternative ways of get, getting evidence out, YouTube and um, infographics, et cetera. So we really do want to be a trusted source um, and respond in a timely fashion. So our acting CEO and editor-in-chief, Carla Suarez Weiser, says, Cochrane is committed to supporting evidence-informed decision-making through the production of high-quality, relevant, and up-to-date research. During the pandemic, COVID has actively been trying to meet all information needs. So for example, Cochrane has put anything related to COVID free. So what would usually be behind a paywall, such as all of the full reviews, are all free. Um, there's special collections on a number of different health areas. There's rapid reviews. There's already 35 new reviews that have been published just during COVID, including some that are already updated. There's YouTube videos and podcasts. And all of this is online for free. So what has the US been doing to respond to the infodemic and COVID? So like I mentioned, Cornell has worked with WHO on breastfeeding guidelines. Our um, University of Pennsylvania Medicine Group has developed rapid guidance reports of recommendations. So they take My, uh, recommendations from a number of different agencies and they create reports of recommendations on vaccination and emergency departments and side effects. And then one of our founding members, the American College of Physicians, has created living practice points. So these are how can practitioners take practice points and implement them so they're answering pressing clinical questions around COVID. The University of Chicago, um, our member, similarly is creating clinical pathways to support COVID care um, and clinical care, also all free. And then within the US network um, as an entity, I participated in a video cast, which was really fun with the well-known video cast called The Addictive Brain. And he has a section called Interview with a Scientist. And it was really informal. We talked about Cochrane and the infodemic. So really an easy way to, to hear about it and get involved. And then all of this information is available free. What all of our 23 affiliate centers are doing related to COVID on our US Cochrane website. And it's just right there on the homepage called COVID-19 repository. So please do check that out. All right. So Nina, we have one last poll. Um, how can you get involved in Cochrane? So I've talked about a lot of different ways, but now I'm going to test you and see um, who we've kept. Okay. So which is not, or which are not Cochrane products? Make sure you scroll all the way down. This is a long one. How's it looking? Uh, pretty good. We're about halfway there. I'll give it about five more seconds. All right, let's share the results. All right, so half of you said mugs and t-shirts. That is incorrect. We do have Cochrane mugs and t-shirts and canvas bags. So go to the Cochrane store and get your swag. Um, comic strips is correct. So to date, there are no comic strips. However, if you no. would like to start that, please do so. Um, okay, so all of those other things are Cochrane products and, and almost all free, available for anyone to access. So again, I just want to emphasize that there's a way for everyone to get involved. So your organization can join the US network. Individually, you be, can become a Cochrane member of the Cochrane organization. There's the library, the study register, there's journal clubs, there's classmate, there's trainings. Um, I'm taking a really great training right now called Cochrane's Dissemination Essentials Course. And this was available to anyone who has any involvement with Cochrane at all. A number of people from various organizations and consumer groups are taking part. And this is a 12 month course with live instruction every month and some assignments in between, super comprehensive, free. Um, we're happy to share and amplify our partner and friend information in our newsletter on our Twitter. 
in social media. The Cochrane Library has an app. So download the Cochrane Library app. It's free wherever you get your apps. Um, and Cochrane Crowd, you can become a citizen scientist, get training, join the Cochrane Global Community on, on helping with all of our, our stuff. So thank you. I know that was a lot of information. Um, and I would love to hear from, from you any questions or feedback or, or thoughts. Well, thank you, Tiffany. That was a very engaging ton of information for us all. Uh, hopefully, none of it was an infodemic. Um, I know. I was like, I'm literally <laughs> being an infodemic, although my information is reliable. So, <laughs> um, let's see. Do we have any questions in the chat? There was one earlier, but I think Patricia uh, addressed it by sending a link. Okay. There. Let's see. There I see is... there's a question regarding the cost of Cochrane membership uh, and okay. the journal subscription. Okay. Um, talk about making it free to all. Do you want to talk about recent open access directives yeah. from funders? Yeah. I do. So Cochrane membership, um, if you individually want to become a Cochrane member, you can go to Cochrane.org right now, or you can go to the US website, which is us.cochrane.org. And every Cochrane website has a join Cochrane button up in the top. So individuals can join Cochrane for free. So you just create a username and password and that's how you can get started in Cochrane Crowd or Task Exchange or take a training. Um, the website is very comprehensive, um, can be a little confusing to use. So please do note my email and feel free to ask for direction or, or help at any time. So mem individual membership is free. Um, now for the Cochrane database of systematic reviews, our journal, that is behind a subscription. Now, many institutions have an uh, institutional subscription. So if you're in a university or like CDC or whatever, you, you almost surely have access to it. If not, I honestly cannot tell you off the top of my head what it would cost to either buy an individual subscription or an organizational subscription. Um, however, as Bob mentioned, and one of those questions kind of highlighted, Cochrane does hope to go open access um, in the near future. It's definitely a main priority. Um, our acting CEO, Carla, who's also our editor in chief is very um, keen on that. She really wants to make it happen. Now Cochrane currently gets a lot of its funding um, because we're very objective. We take little funding um, and all Cochrane researchers are volunteers. No one can pay Cochrane to publish their stuff. Cochrane doesn't pay anybody. So Cochrane funding has come from the Cochrane Library. So that's something that needs to be kind of sorted out and figure out when we go open access, what does that mean for sustainability? But yes, it is, it is the hope that, um, but besides the database of systematic reviews where all of the full texts are, almost everything else on the Cochrane Library, the plain language summaries, the trainings, the podcasts, the accompanying materials are free. And Tiffany, I knew, I know the whole library was open access for a while at the beginning of the pandemic. Is mm -hmm. the COVID related uh, work open access? And I yep. think also about 60% of the older, like six months or older are open access too right now. So there's a large percentage of the, uh, library that's open access, but not all of it right now. Correct, correct. Tiffany, what's been the biggest challenge to you um, becoming the US Cochrane uh, coordinator? Well, my background is global nutrition. So for 20 years, I've worked in global nutrition. I worked at um, Centers for Disease Control and I lived abroad in numerous countries working for WHO and UNICEF and other NGOs. So although I worked, I was familiar with Cochrane Reviews. I was not a Cochrane researcher. I have never undertaken a systematic review. Um, so I think just wrapping my head around how comprehensive Cochrane is and just understanding everything that's available, how it works, um, who's who um, has, has been a bit of a challenge. And then of course coming, I came on board almost exactly a year ago 
COVID was raging. Everyone was locked down. I'm starting a new job with two little kids at home, not in school, who I'm trying to help with online school. You can't get a babysitter because California was very, very closed. Um, so, you know, I think just the same challenges that everyone else had this year, but I will say that I have been enormously enjoying all of the people within the US network as well as Cochrane at large. And it's, I've really, really been enjoying this job. And I hope to hear from some of you in the audience, if not now, then in, in some way later. Well, uh, congratulations on doing such a tremendous uh, job as our US network coordinator and such a tremendous job on today's talk. You had a record crowd for our uh, session. So thanks for bringing everybody in and giving us the information that people have wanted. Um, yeah, thanks to you and Patty and Nina and Lisa. I appreciate all of, I know there's a lot of back work um, behind the scenes. So thank you to the, the four of you for organizing all of that. And Nina, do we have any information on our next um, seminar that we want the audience to know about at this time? Um, I, I'll just say, uh, let me see if I can put the link in. Um, there was, some of you noticed there was a glitch with the time zone setting in our registration system. Um, I need to sort that out before I post anymore, but we do have things scheduled every month from now till September, Bob, is that right? That sounds right. Yes. And I'll just, uh, <laughs> we're going to be busy over this. Summer. First, we thought we're going to take a break, but then yeah. we got a bunch of great speakers <laughs> right. lined up. Um, so I, I put the URL in. This is, it's um, for all the librarians out there. It's a lib guide. You all know what that is. Everybody else, it's the website for the Rocky Mountain Cochrane Lecture Series. Um, what is up and coming is posted there with links to register. And I'll get that time zone thing figured out. So you yeah. can register without incident. And then the, uh, this is where we post all the links to past recordings as well. So um, I'll, I'll try to get that done by Wednesday. I'll get Tiffany's uh, talk here processed and posted. Uh, that's the best source um, single It's URL on the source. US website too, on the US. Oh yes, website. yeah, you're gonna post it there too, yeah. Right there. All righty. Can I just, this is Lisa Barrow. Can I just give a heads up on those next yes, two? Yes, Tiffany, yes, that was a really, oh, go ahead. Super uh, presentation. Thank you so much for that. Thanks, um, and just our next two seminars are actually going to be joint with the Colorado Evidence Synthesis Program, which is one of the partners um, that Cochrane has. And we're going to be, really be focusing on some of the kind of non traditional uh, development and use of systematic reviews. So our next speaker is Nick Chartres from UCSF, who's going to talk about systematic reviews in environmental health. And then our speaker following that is Lisa Askey from WHO, who's actually going to be uh, talking about WHO science division that deals with these um, guidelines that Tiffany was talking about, but also all of their other um, scientific products. So I hope we can see, I hope we get as good a turnout as Tiffany did. That would be great. And Nick's talk is July 20th, I believe. So mark your calendar for, I believe it's noon Rocky Mountain time, July 20th. And that Nick one is, on what, you can register for that one right now if you want, if you click on that link that I shared. Fabulous. Well, it looks like we might be taking a one month leave. So maybe our next talk is in July. So people get out there and enjoy the beginning of summer. Thank you so much for coming and enjoying uh, Tiffany's talk today. And thank you, Tiffany, uh, for thank giving such guys. a fabulous talk. Thank you, everyone. Talk. I appreciate it. See you in two months, everybody. Take care.